This is Donald Parham. You're listening to Chargers Unleashed, part of the LA Football Network. Stay diggy. Hey, this is Chris Rump II, Chargers outside linebacker, and make sure you check out Chargers Unleashed. Shout out to Chargers Unleashed, Sebastian Joseph Day, you know the vibes, we outside. Are you checking in with Mike Williams from the LA Chargers, and you're tuning in to Chargers Unleashed. You're listening to the Chargers Unleashed podcast with your host, Dan Wolkenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, being brought to you by Bet Online, Charger Bolt Family, and Rock Solid Sports Memorabilia. If this is your first time tuning in the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, as Europe once famously quoted in one of their biggest songs. I was like, the country? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's the final countdown. We are now 10 days away thank you so much for understanding my reference dan i really appreciate it 10 days away from the nfl draft like i said we're moving slower than molasses trying to get to next thursday but it's coming it's coming we're all over there and welcome happy monday sir how are you i am great happy monday to you and to everyone tuning in viewing listening worldwide including europe uh i'm just wondering what people in europe would say the, the quotes that they would have the band europe <laughs> <laughs> uh super exciting and fun show today uh friend of the show one of the best when it comes to draft analyst a one austin gale from the ringer is going to be joining us to talk all things los angeles chargers nfl draft predictions who he thinks could be the pick at 21 and 54 who he wouldn't take uh there's some hot takes for sure but one of the things i love most about austin is he is honest and only honest it doesn't matter if it's going against the grain that's why he's one of the best that's why he's his rise has been so quick. Uh, Jake, let's talk about our friends over at Bet Online. Want to remind everybody once again that Bet Online remains your number one source for all of your football betting needs this season. Obviously, coming up to 2023, but outside of football, you can always find the fastest and easiest ways to bet on all your favorite sports and events just like MLB, MMA, tennis, boxing, NBA playoffs, or even golf. So head on over to betonline.ag to join and receive your 100% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use that promo code BELIEVE. That's B-L-E-A-V to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. Austin Gale from The Ringer joins us next on Chargers Unleashed. Very special guest, friend of the show, with the one and only Austin Gale from The Ringer is joining us on Chargers Unleashed to talk a little NFL draft and the Los Angeles Chargers positioning in it. Austin, thank you so much for joining us. You're always welcome. Love having you on. Your breath of knowledge to everyone. How are you? Doing fantastic. Excited to talk some Chargers ball, talk more draft. Uh, count down the days until we're done with all of this and on to the, the doldrums of June and July. But it, it, I'm, I'm excited to talk some draft. For those who do not know Austin at the Ringer, please go check out his work. He does so much and honestly, one of the brightest minds, in my opinion, on NFL draft topics. He can talk circles around everybody, in my opinion. Uh, again, talk about all things NFL draft, talk about the Chargers, talk about predictions, which we're going to get into here at the end. Uh, but Austin, I guess first and foremost for you, like outsider perspective, what does it look like on the outside for this Chargers team? You know, they went in, they they got Eric Kendricks as that linebacker, kind of vocal leader to kind of replace the middle of the field for Drew Tranquil. They re-signed a, a tight end. They re-signed their right tackle, which I think was a huge one. As of as of today, it seems like they have re-signed uh, restricted free agent Jalen Guyton to kind of help with speed. How do you see the lay of the land for this Chargers team going into the draft? I, I think I think that there is a lot of star power on this roster in terms of names that the average fan or even you know diehard Chargers fan recognize, right? Keenan Allen back, Mike Williams back, Josh Palmer. I, I do think that that receiving core specifically is a lot older and maybe more name power than it is like legitimate talent. And I think defensively, you can kind of say the same things. The best player on this defense is obviously Joey Bosa, but after that, like Khalil Mack has lost a step. I think even Eric Kendricks has lost a step. I worry that this roster is maybe too old. I also worry that this roster is overinvested in some of the players that, you know, this, this, you know, Spanos and Telesco have like really committed to and don't want to move on from. Sure. I think that they're, 
They, they have to have an injection of young talent. We've been talking about speed for this receiving core. It feels like for 10 years, but they desperately, desperately need that again. And that doesn't even factor in. I still think there are concerns along the offensive line. I, I think that this Chargers team on paper, as constant as Christmas in December, everyone talks about how this, this roster is so good, how this roster is, you know, they should be competing for the AFC West and they always fall short. And I think it's, because of the names, right? It's easy on paper, the written out names, whether they're crossed out or underlined, that's the succession reference there. Like it's easy to look at this roster on paper and say the name power, the star power is there. This should be a team that's competing for an AFC championship or whatever it may be. They need younger talent. They need to be faster on both sides of the ball. And I, I wonder how much you can do that in this draft. You have the, you know, the, the guy that cures all a lot of sins and in, in Justin Herbert, but him being healthy is super important. The offensive line is still concerning. I think the Chargers have a lot of work to do on this roster, and they put themselves in this hole because you're overcommitting in some ways and restructuring contracts to keep a Keenan Allen on the roster, to keep a Mike Williams on the roster, and keep some of these names that you do like. I think, you know, and real quick, Jake, I want to kind of follow up on that. A lot of people talk about this team being very, like, top-heavy in terms of contracts. You look at, like, mm-hmm. Derwin James, Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa. You mentioned Justin Herbert's going to be getting his money soon. Got Keenan Allen, Mike Williams. There's a bunch of big names, big contracts, and the underbelly, I think, is sometimes what gets uh, seen as the the weakness, if you will. But you talked about the offensive line. You said that you're so concerned about it. In my opinion, and I'm just going to push back a little bit, like, I don't know where they could improve, really, in the offensive line. Mm -hmm. Like, they have, from right to left, finally, they have a starting five that I think folks are, like, clamoring for. They went Corey Lindsay in the middle. They got Rashawn Slater on the left. They got Trey Pipkins on the right. Zion Johnson, who's their first round pick last year. And then, you know, Hail Mary, thank God, they had Jamari Sawyer as a sixth round pick they got last year, who played tackle for them, but I think is more specifically ready for guard. Where do you see the hole there? Like, like what do you see it needing to improve? The, the, the weak point is definitely Pipkins. I, I think Pipkins on the right side. And I think it's always the toughest position, right? It's always the toughest position to, you know, sew up right tackle when you have a star left tackle in Rashawn Slater. And obviously they've spent a lot of money on, on Corey Lindsley and spent high draft capital on Zion Johnson. I think Pipkins is still the weak link there. And it's such a, it's such a weak link unit, right? PFF has talked about this forever and that you're always looking at the offensive line is who's your weakest member. That's who teams are going to consistently attack. And regardless of, if you have four hall of famers, you know, left tackle, left guard, center, right guard. If you do have this weak point on the right side, that's where defenses are going to kind of game plan to, to beat you up. And that doesn't even factor in. Obviously there's, there's depth concerns along the offensive line. There's depth concerns with every offensive line. Of course. The, the worry again is not necessarily that the offensive line is bad and you're, you're not going to be able to handle it. It's just like, there are enough weaknesses on this roster. I think speed in the receiving core, right tackle for Trey Pipkins running back. We still don't know what's going to happen with Austin Eckler. Obviously he said he'll play, this season, but you know, disgruntled running back, you never like to see it. And then defensively, again, it's more names than star power. I think that the Chargers desperately need to look at this draft as an opportunity to get faster on offense and add maybe a running back to look as a future piece, you know, future piece, and then also look at receiver to score more than anybody. Because Brandon Staley has done a lot to try and improve this defense, right? JC Jackson, I think, is the highest cap hit of any player on this roster in 2023. Khalil Max, number two. And both those guys didn't do as much as you could or probably wanted them to this previous season. JC Jackson, maybe not just a fit for this scheme or whatever it may be. Finding ways to kill on offense, be a top three offense in the NFL, I think is, is the way you get around what have been consistent, consistent weaknesses for Brandon Staley's group. Dan, we're about four minutes into this podcast. Austin Gale just bringing the ugly truth <laughs> on the show. You're talking already. Jake's language. I love, I love it, man. First of all, I love the fact that you had said that the Chargers have put themselves in this position because they really have handcuffed themselves when it's come to outside free agents that they can add to this team coming into the draft. And then again, it's putting more pressure on Tom Telesco and Brandon Staley, especially after the debacle in Jacksonville last year about having to come out and perform this season. But let's switch it over to the draft. Obviously, you, you've been mentioning They need to get faster on offense and defense. And there's been obviously a shift in opinion since the combine, since the pro days and obviously free agency that, you know, early on it was, oh, for sure. It looks like it's going to be tight end for the Chargers at 21. Then maybe it shifted a little bit to the receiver. And now it sounds like the consensus is either the Chargers should go on the defensive side of the ball, given the way that this wide receiver class has panned out or, which I know a lot of people are hoping for, they need to trade out of that 21 spot. What do you think? Trading out is always difficult analysis for me because you need someone to trade up with, right? Or someone, there's two sides to that group. And if the quarterbacks are all off the board by 21, which I assume they are the top four, that is. And then if you're, maybe if a Quentin Johnson is slipping or a Jackson Smith, the Jigba for whatever reason is slipping, maybe there's like a receiver sexy enough 
to go move up. I, I, I just doubt that at 21, there are going to be teams chomping at the bit to go up in this draft class specifically because people have said it a thousand times by now, but it's a deep class, not a top heavy class, right? Jalen Carter, Will Anderson, the four quarterbacks, and some teams don't even have first round grades on all four of the quarterbacks. Will Levis and Anthony Richardson are very polarizing prospects in this class. I think that the Chargers are going to end up wanting to trade down from 21, but maybe not having the opportunity to or have the other party on the other line willing to trade up. And from that point, you stick at 21. If there is one of these small, fast receivers that you are enamored with in this pre-draft process, I think Zay Flowers has been mocked to the Chargers at 21 a thousand times. Jalen Hyatt has been in that spot as well. If the Chargers love one of those guys, I think you do it. If not, I think cornerback is the other place I look. And I know you just spent on J.C. Jackson. I know you have Asante Samuel Jr., but the best teams in this league really do prioritize that position and continue to throw resources at it. And as we saw, J.C. Jackson's injury, also not really a fit when he got on the football field. When you look at the strength of this class in the 20s, I want to be a team that's taking one of these receivers, these flyers, like I say, Flowers, or um, potentially Quentin Johnson if he falls that far, or I'm looking at cornerback like Deontay Banks, Joey Porter Jr., or someone that I feel can come in and, and play opposite um, of J.C. Jackson and maybe even fill in for J.C. Jackson if it continues not to be a fit. So let's go to day one. Like, I think if you talk to Chargers fans – there's kind of probably three subsets. There's the fans who would want Bijan Robinson or bust and somehow praying that he falls, which in my opinion, I do think he does fall to 21. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the folks who say wide receiver or bust where they don't care what the value is. They just want to get a receiver because that's what the Chargers need the most. And then there's kind of the everyone else where they either want a tight end or they want to go, I don't know, corner. Or they want to just go BPA edge. Where do you sit in terms of like of those three buckets do you go bpa at 21 if you're the chargers given where they are do you go for biggest need which could possibly be the receiver route like what, what's your kind of strategy going into it the chargers and we talked about you know them putting themselves in this roster hole or putting themselves in this box you do that by over investing in free agency and also over investing in low value positions right Corey lindsley is a center you brought in Sebastian Joseph Day and Austin Johnson on big contracts, both defensive tackles. You look at, if they go B. John Robinson at 21, I would pull my hair out. Like, they do not have the luxury to do that. Teams that can draft B.J. Robinson, B. John Robinson at 21 are ones that have all, very few, but have all those high value positions locked up and resources committed. You have, it's such a luxury pick, right? When you look at the chiefs, when they drafted Clyde Edwards Hilaire, the analysis of that pick was like, Oh my gosh, last piece of this offense is exactly what they needed, but it ends up not working out for whatever reason. I'm not saying Clyde Edwards Hilaire and Bijan Robinson are comparable <laughs> prospects, but taking a running back in the first round is now a luxury, right? It's very similar to off ball linebacker. I think it's very similar to tight end. Those are low value positions that rarely pan out when you're going in the first round for the chargers. High value positions, you know, positions that you're paying a lot of money on these second contracts. Positional value is not some made up thing by the nerds. How much do you pay your offensive tackle? How much more is that than a linebacker? That's what positional value is. How much do you pay your quarterback? How much do you pay your edge rusher? How much do you pay your receiver? Compare that to guard, center, linebacker. Those are the high positions of value, and the others are obviously the low positions of value. So looking at receiver corner again is probably where I lean. And I also think that defensively, you have to get cheaper, right? I wrote this article a year ago in August. Can new blood revitalize Brandon Staley's defense in Los Angeles? I was there at Chargers camp. They brought in Sebastian Joseph Day, Derwin James on a new contract, Khalil Mack. Oh, they had Kyle Van Oy. Like, is this what's going to actually unlock Brandon Staley's defense? And it didn't. Defense is very volatile. Bringing in names doesn't always help. Fit matters a ton. You have to continue to add in that side. So corner, edge on the defensive side of the ball, I think makes sense. And obviously on the offensive side of the ball, the more you can do – to put up 30 points a game, 35 points a game in a dangerous AFC with Burrow. Talk about it. Um, Mahomes, obviously. Like, th this is how you're going to get it done. So it it'll be interesting. I think if they go linebacker or running back, I'd be pulling my hair out <laughs> if I was a Chargers fan. <laughs> if they go linebacker, this whole this whole fan base is going to burn it down. Like, <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So let's talk about a little bit about those weapons, Austin. Obviously, for wide receivers, we know what the Chargers need. It's speed, speed, speed. For tight ends, this obviously is a very, very deep group in this class. You, the Chargers have brought back the same tight end group that they had going into last year. As far as, you know, the priorities, people can question that as far as all they want to for day one, and maybe the value is not there. We're not sure how the draft is going to fall. But guys who you may look to shift that focus to on day two, go through some of your guys who you think that you feel – either at the wide receiver or the tight end position, that would just be ideal fits for the Chargers on that day two spot. 
So, so I do think that when you talk about receiver, I think it is a deeper class than it is one that has a lot of top heavy talent. And when you get to day two, I think that there are receivers that can fit what Zay Flowers technically brings to this offense, but maybe at a discounted version. I think Marvin Mims Jr. is everyone's favorite day two receiver. He's the Oklahoma wideout. I really do like Jaden Reed out of Michigan State. I think he reminds me so much of what Dotson was coming out of Penn State and that he's a smaller guy, but plays a lot bigger, has the catch radius, has the leaping ability, spectacular catch ability you see in the games against Michigan each of the last two years. Tyler Scott is a speedster that I think will be there on day two. That's the Cincinnati receiver. And then you got the two guys with the double alliteration, Trey Tucker out of Cincinnati and the Darius. Davis out of TCU. Those two guys, five foot nine, five foot eight, really, really small, short arms, but speed, speed, speed. So if the Chargers, and I don't think they're doing this, but if the Chargers are like, we need to get faster, it doesn't have to be forced at 21, right? At 21, you can look at edge, which has a steep drop off after that. You can also look at right tackle. Like I know they've committed to Trey Pipkins, but adding depth to the offensive line, if that makes sense with Paris Johnson, Broderick Jones, one of those guys that's in that spot. And then of course, um, Looking again at day two and, and thinking about the, the players that could be available for them then, I again, like I don't think you should go linebacker. I don't think you should be looking at defensive tackle. If you were, however, looking at these low-value positions, I am a big fan of Siaka, Siaki Ika, the Bear, Baylor defensive tackle that can come in. And yes, you have Austin Johnson. Yes, you have Sebastian Joseph Day. But adding someone that big that plays the run that well, something that Brandon Staley has missed really ever since he got to the Los Angeles Chargers, that's another way to do it too. I, I think that day two is where a lot of teams will have the opportunity to win in this class and get starters at some of these low-value positions. I always look at day two for guard, linebacker, uh, interior offensive line. I think you can get starters on day two versus day one. It's the premium positions. Now, I want you to talk to our viewers and listeners about kind of the – one of the concerns people have about receivers specifically – is mm -hmm. this idea of, you know, especially this class, the the sheer size, you know, they don't check the box of six to 210. And you see so many guys that are in that like five, nine, five to five, nine, five, 11 ish to like 165, 185 mark. In today's NFL, is that an issue or is it as much of an issue? It's definitely, it's definitely, I wouldn't say it's an issue. I, I think that if you're bringing in a smaller receiver, it limits you in terms of the offense that you can build around that player, right? It, a lot of smaller receivers struggle to get off press. So you have to scheme open touches. Okay, how many players can you have on your roster that have to have schemed touches over winning routes versus press? That's what you have to think about, right? And like, if you're, you know, that whole cliche of you don't want to, you know, team of outliers, it's okay to look at an outlier, but not have a team of outliers for receiver, I never want to have multiple guys that have to be scheme touches in order to get the ball, right? I don't want to have five Kadarius Tonys, right? As good as Kadarius Tony is, right? It's not going to be helpful in terms of building an offense around five Kadarius Tonys because you're going to have to run a lot of bubble screens and everyone's going to get their share. Whereas for the Los Angeles Chargers, they don't have that guy, right? You're going to tell me that's John Hightower. You're going to tell me that's Jalen Guyton, who just resigned on the restricted free agency. Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, Josh Palmer, all at varying degrees of success, are guys that are supposed to get open at the line of scrimmage, burst press, burst zone coverages, catch everything thrown their way. Mike Williams, obviously the best of that in the contested catches. They don't have this speedster flyer type, this Tony type that will be their bubble screens, crossers, merchant, making plays after the catch. Mike Williams is a tad slower. Keenan Allen only gets slower and obviously more hurt. Josh Palmer, yes, he had yak ability at Tennessee, but you see that speed drop off now that he is in the NFL versus what he was doing with Tennessee. Bring in a guy that... When you are in these like second and two, second and Please. three situations, and you can go down the field, spread things open. I, I really do think that's what the missing piece is for this offense. Not the missing piece in that it'll be perennially top two, top three with the Kansas City Chiefs right there, but one that will unlock something that just simply hasn't had. Austin, I've been an uh, advocate of the edge position just by the way that the predictive board is going to fall by the time it ends up mm -hmm. getting to the Chargers. And you just mentioned it. For the edge class specifically, you have the premier guys at one, and then there is a drop-off after that. Mm -hmm. Specifically at 21, you know, uh, we all expect guys like the Nolan Smiths, the Lucas Van Nesses to probably be off the board before the Chargers are on the clock. So does a Will McDonald, does that sound like too much of a reach at 21? Or does was, would that still be right in the wheelhouse for it, given what his skill set and what he would bring to a team when you're looking behind the depth of Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack? 
Well, what's so funny is I remember Danny Kelly, he is our draft analyst here at the ringer. I remember texting him somewhere halfway through the season. And I'm like, Will McDonald's like, dude, I think this guy has something. I think he's going to be potentially a first rounder. And then, every, then all this hype rolled in. I saw him like mocked in the top 10. I was like, okay, I liked him. I didn't like him. <laughs> Whoa. Like that. I <laughs> now, a Will McDonald at 21, maybe that's a reach on some team's board. He's another size outlier, right? Where are you going to play him? He's a lot lightweight. Nolan Smith is a size outlier, outlier, even though he does have like the obvious burst, the 10-yard split, the 40-yard dash were insane for what he was. This edge class to me is a lot of guys where you're – I'd rather bet on one of them having elite traits, like elite traits, than some guy that kind of has like an average of all of it. So like Nolan Smith, Will McDonald, I, I do think those two specifically at that spot would be great. After that, it's such a huge drop-off to almost where I'd want to be looking at the position – uh, on day two, right? Keon White, I still think is a project. I I think um, BJ Ojulari is going to get underdrafted. I think he's a really talented player that maybe hasn't been mocked a ton in the first round. That's the LSU edge defender, Derek Love Hall him. out of Auburn. Love Yaya Derek Yabi. Hall. He, Love Derek Hall. There are guys on day two at edge that I would love to have on day two versus say Lucas Van Ness at 21 or even Miles Murphy at 21. And I'm lower on those two guys than I think the consensus is. With Van Ness, Never a starter at Iowa, and but he did play all the important downs. He played all the he was you know premier pass rusher on those downs, but still doesn't have that second move. I hate to make the comparison, but he does kind of remind me in terms of as a prospect, LJ Collier coming out of TCU. When I sat down with LJ Collier at the combine, he said, I don't need a second move as long or I don't need multiple moves. I need one move and a counter. He's like, I just gotta get that counter. Drafted in the first round of the Seattle Seahawks. We've been waiting to see that counter ever since. I think there's similar, there's similarities in like what Lucas Van Ness has in terms of his arsenal of pass rushing moves right now coming out of Iowa. And for Miles Murphy, the bend, the athleticism, the explosiveness, I still don't see the hand usage and all that stuff that you want from an edge rusher that's coming out in the first round. And that, to me, is enough to say, hey, let's not force edge at 21. Let the board fall to us. We can go corner. We can go offensive tackle. When people bring up best player available, when you're talking about the first round, it's best player available at these premium positions. So if corner – edge receiver tackle obviously not qb one of those you're going to have a guy that is not considered a reach at that point not considered you know going too far down your board to go get a premium position there's going to be someone there that you like at 21 at one of those four positions that's the one i think i take we're talking to the flamethrower real talk today with austin <laughs> gale uh from the ringer okay so a couple questions then um you're tom telesco and you're looking at this, and you're looking at kind of the, the way the draft is set up. You've done a ton of mock drafts yourself. In the 21st position, like if you if you had to predict what is the premium position that quote-unquote falls to you, mm -hmm. and, who do you, and do you take it? I think corner is going to be where they're going to have an opportunity, right? Like I think Deontay Banks, Joey Porter Jr., Emmanuel Forbes, potentially Keely Ringo, like at 21, you're going to be considering it, right? I also think wide receiver. I think there is a chance Jackson Smith, the Jigba is available there at 21. There's a chance Addison is available in that spot. Say Flowers is available in that spot. Quinton Johnston could be there at 21, given the up and down views of his game, right? Like of all those, of receiver, all those guys who, of, of those receivers, if they're all there, who are you taking for the Chargers specifically? It sucks because Jackson Smith, the Jigba, does not fill that speed need. But if Jackson Smith, the Jigba, is there at 21, I'm taking him. He's my favorite receiver in this class. He's a tier by himself. I have JSN1, Gap, and then I have some of these other guys I'm interested in taking, like Quentin Johnson, Jordan Addison, Zay Flowers, another Gap, Cedric Tillman, Jalen Hyatt, kind of having the same vibe. I know a lot of people really like Hyatt, love the speed, love the vertical threat. I think Tillman's right there with him in terms of what he can do in the NFL. Josh Downs, Jaden Reed, those are guys in that second tier. So if JSN there at 21, I know you're not getting the speed that you're looking for, but man, you put him in that offense instead of Palmer and you have Allen Williams and JSN. I, I think you're cooking at the short intermediate levels of the field. That's where um, this offense wants to be where it was last year. And I think even where it could be with Kellen Moore this upcoming season. Um, so I would go JSN, but if he's off the board and you still have a chance at Zay flowers, potentially, I think that would be the other pick Jordan Addison. I'm not as high on Addison as other people are. I think people like him a lot more than I do. I, I worry about the size. I worry about the speed. There are very few receivers to ever survive in the league at his size and his speed. Whereas Zay Flowers, obviously a little bit smaller, but the weight is there, and he obviously has some legitimate speed coming out of Boston. I, I really like him as a prospect at 21. I think that's where I'd go.
Um, I'm infatuated since the beginning. I have been infatuated with Tank Dell. Mm -hmm. And I know he's one of those like size be damned guys. Jake likes to use yeah. that term. Um, in my opinion, he is the best fit for the Los Angeles Chargers, regardless of round. I think mm -hmm. it's him or Mims, in my opinion, at this point. Um, what are your thoughts on him specifically? I love Tank Dell. I think he's a great player for the Chargers. I think he's a great player, great fit for what they need. They need a fast guy that can get open, catches everything, all that stuff. The problem is, is like a team like the Giants can't take fucking Tank Dell because they have a bunch of Tank <laughs> Eight of them. Like they have, they have too many <laughs> of the same guy. And as good as maybe Tank Dell will be, it's not, it's not there. Like Miami could be that because of how they use that offense and how they leverage speed and how they get guys that don't have good size of the ball. There are just so many teams that would turn Tank Dell into a bust, right? Like the Raiders would turn him into a bust because they don't know how to leverage guys that have small size. They want bigger receivers. They want these big types. Like Hunter Renfro barely see the field with how they're using him. And like, I, I think that he goes to the right team, goes to a team like the chargers that needs this profile in their bag of tricks. You could see the best of him. Right. But if he goes to a team where his skill set's a little bit redundant or the offense doesn't know necessarily how to you know scheme these types of receivers open next thing you know, like tank Dell is finishing every year with like 18 catches for 300 yards. You're like, man, Ugh. they haven't really worked out for him. But like so much of that situation matters. It's something that I think we get, this is the cycle of the draft process. Like, this guy's sick. This guy's sick. I'm a X player stand. Then you get to the end. You're like, honestly, this guy goes, you just got to go to a good situation. He'll be good. Like that's it. But you end up getting the situation where like how much of draft evaluation is kind of dumb. And, and we just need to, <laughs> what am I doing just, here? Like, so we just pick big, good athletes and then hire coaches that know how to use them. That's probably the end and all be all fair. How important or how impactful is the addition to Kellen Moore in this offense in terms of scheme compared to what they had with Joe Lombardi? Because, like, I think in Chargers land, especially for the fans, that's like the holy grail, saving yeah. grace, please, for the love of God, can we get this offense figured out? Is Kellen Moore the guy? Like, how much of an impact is he? It's a it's a bad answer for podcasting. I apologize in advance. But it's incomplete, right? Because I don't think we know. Like, a lot of the same problems the Chargers or the, the, the Cowboys had with that offense, and Kellen Moore working with Dak Prescott and asking too much of him and, and, and not – really finding creative ways to get people open was kind of where we were with the Los Angeles Chargers, right? I don't think we know what um, Kellen Moore is going to bring exactly as an offensive play caller until he's removed from Mike McCarthy. Because Mike McCarthy had his hand over that by a lot. So him being by himself and him having now this opportunity to be a play caller standalone, because Staley is not even going to touch that side of the ball, not anywhere remotely close to what Mike McCarthy was doing. What Kellen Moore does with Justin Herbert, and this offense specifically could be completely different than what was asked of him in Dallas. Cause I do think that there was a lot of puppeteering with Mike McCarthy there. It's why Herb they're so Herb comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's why they're so comfortable moving on from Kellen Moore and not replacing him. Right. Mike McCarthy is just going to step in and do a lot of what he was probably doing last year. What Kellen Moore has to do to be the saving grace that Chargers fans want him to be is obviously push the ball downfield more. I mean, they've been low, one of the lowest average depth of target teams on early downs in the NFL since Lombardi was there. You have to change that. You have a quarterback with a cannon arm, find a way to do that. And some people say that's the offensive line. That's why I added Zion Johnson. Some people say that's receiver. That's why you're looking at speed. For me, that's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem and the thing that Kellen Moore, I think, could be bringing with him from Dallas is you can't ask your quarterback to be a superstar every play. Like, that's what they did with Dak Prescott. Hey, first, second, third, four, three, progressions, progressions. No, give me a bubble screen. Give me something like that. Now, again, is that personnel or is that what Kellen Moore wants to do? Because when you look at with Dallas, CeeDee Lamb, and that's it. They literally had to sign T.Y. Hilton off the street to get speed into that offense. Like, Chargers can't be in that situation too. Kellen Moore can't call on those same excuses or same reasons, same personnel problems for why the offense is stale or not you know, getting free buckets, free layups for Justin Herbert when we're halfway point through the season. Kellen Moore, I think, still has a lot to prove. It's not the slam dunk hire that people think it is yet, in my opinion. I think we need to see what these first four to eight weeks look like. Also, we talked about everything as it relates to the 21st overall pick. We talked about the premier positions. I would like to hear, and I love hearing this from – anybody that we have in this show or just anybody who takes a really deep dive into the draft, because as you had mentioned, you know, your, your, your opinion is different than maybe the consensus on certain players, but which I, I love, love by the way, <laughs> I would, I would love to hear whether we're talking day two, day three, but guys who just aren't getting talked about enough. So say 
Austin Gales guys mm-hmm. in this draft. Who would some of those guys be? And it doesn't even have to relate to the Chargers, but who are some of your guys that you just absolutely love in this draft? I, I really, I, I hate to, I, I've watched a lot of the receivers and, and I keep bringing up the receiver position, but A.T. Perry out of Wake Forest, one of the few big guys in this class. Like, get, let me get that guy on day two, day three, a winner at Wake Forest, a guy that's been there doing that for a long time. I think he's one I really did like in the pre-draft process. I also like Rasheed Rice, the SMU receiver that didn't have a good senior bowl. And then you kind of look at his combine metrics like, wait, maybe I stay away from this guy. But he's got he's an absolute dog, right? You you turn on the tape of him blocking as you know, blocking in the run game and, and doing these things that you want from receivers, but never really get from guys that are drafted in the early rounds. He's another dude. Look, I'll take I'll take 10 Rasheed Rices before, before I take some of these other receivers that are being mocked consistently in the first round. Someone I don't love a lot, Jonathan Mingo, the old miss wide receiver. He's got the high RAS, you know, he's got the high athleticism score. Everyone loves that. But I, I, when you turn on the tape, there's just something I'm missing. There's something that's not there with Mingo that maybe you do see with some of these other receivers that don't have that athletic ability. In terms of the cornerback class, we all love talking about Kansas State Julius Brents at the Senior Bowl, and now no one's talking about him. Brents is a, a legit, legit oh outside cornerback prospect. I think you get him – Day two, day three, you're walking out of the draft very, very happy with the prospects of getting a premium player at a premium position in that in that um, that realm there. I, I'm trying to think of other guys. I'm looking through my list here, guys that I like. I'll give you a linebacker. I know we're not talking linebackers, but the Chargers Dorian could go Williams. linebacker. The Chargers could go linebacker. <laughs> Dorian Just not a Williams out of Tulane. Dorian Williams out of Tulane is everything people want DeMarvion overshone to be out of Texas, just better. Like just everything that, he, that people think overshone is, but a lot better. He's faster, better 10 yard split, better football player, better between the tackles, better at taking on blocks. I think Dorian Williams is going to be another guy that another one of these guys where you're looking at interior offensive line, linebacker, defensive tackle guys that aren't coveted maybe in the first 32, but on day two, you're getting a starter. I think Dorian Williams is a starter out of the gate. Now we ask everybody. And again, if you have not checked out Austin Gale stuff, please go check out what he does. He's a genius, in my opinion. And he doesn't do what everyone else does. He actually gives his honest opinion, which may go against the grain. Um, I think it's the, one of the things that Chargers fans are kind of enamored by is you know, they, they look at archetypes, they look at kind of comps. You know, and everybody sees Dalton Kincaid as like, oh, like, what if he could be our Travis Kelsey? And he, he, Justin Herbert's Travis Kelsey. Can you imagine? In your opinion, and I think to, the two positions I want to look at specifically are tight end and running back. Mm-hmm. In your opinion, pick of the litter. And we, again, that depends on which way you go. If it's round one, two, three, doesn't matter. Who are the best fit? Let's just go one or two at each position for the Chargers. And where would they need to be picked? I, at tight I end and running back. I think Kincaid is the best fit. I, I'm not as high on Musgrave. I'm not as high on Mayer as other people are. Kincaid, Kelsey comps, uh, I, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet with Kincaid. One of the notes I put down with Kincaid is he's always on the ground as a blocker. And I think he's still learning balance and these things that like I think Kelsey has. I know Kelsey's not viewed as Rob Gronkowski as a blocker, but Kincaid I still think needs to get a lot better for whatever reason. And I think this tight end class is good. It is being hyped to a degree I don't think it's there, right? And I think it's because we've had so many bad tight end classes. We've had so many where you know guys aren't even coming off the board in round one, and the guys that do come off the board in round one are being you know um, traded soon after. Like all that stuff. For me, Luke Musgrave, dude, far away, right? It's, I'm far away on Luke Musgrave than people are like taking him in the first round. Like this guy didn't even play last year. Even in the year prior to that, I still worry about what as he is a play, pass catcher. Michael Mayer. What's the peak you're getting from Michael Mayer? I don't think it's, you know, a Travis Kelsey game breaker type. And for me, the tight end position, you can get high value starters, guys that can come in, block and be these multiple player, but none, there's what, one or two that we even know of that can put up Kelsey numbers. Like Gronk was that. We know that um, people think Kyle Pitts is that. If we can look at Kyle Pitts and he still hasn't bossed him into what everyone thought he was going to be, the unicorn he was going to be. I'm not saying it's out yet. I I still think he's a talented player. We'll see how it goes. But like, it has if it doesn't hit the ground running for him, you think Luke Musgrave's gonna come out of the gate and put up fucking 60 there's just no way. Like that, <laughs> you this position of any position, tight end, takes time. You do not see guys hitting the ground running at the tight end position. It's such a steep learning curve for that position to start making plays in the NFL. It's why so often tight ends, like good tight ends, don't really start breaking the game until their second contracts or third contracts, even with other teams. So tight end, I like Dalton Kincaid. I don't think he's gonna get past. Even the Green Bay Packers at 16, I think they're going to look at pass catchers, specifically Dalton Cade. For running back, Bijan's the top guy. Everyone after that, I mean, you're looking at maybe guys that you don't have as three-down players. But if I could pick one, 
that could be this three down player that you get on day two is Zach Charbonnet out of UCLA. I think he is Ben Solak made this comparison. I couldn't agree more. He is what a lot of people really liked in Tyler Algier, but like times 1.2, 1.3, right? Tyler Algier was like this complete pack that you know could be a three down player, but the athleticism maybe isn't there and he's still working as a tackle breaker, but the balance is good. Charbonnet is just like a little bit of an upgraded version of that, which an upgraded version of Tyler Algier, I think is a day two pick, but a legitimate starter in the league. You're still going to need something to complement Charbonnet with, with speed, but I do think it's a guy that you can see running the ball on first and second down. Austin, normally Dan likes asking this question to wrap it up with, but we always like asking all of our guests on this one. We always come up with the hypothetical as far as the home run picks, Mm -hmm. as far as if the Chargers came away with their first round pick at 21, their second round pick at 50 war, I'm not going to make you pick 85 because that's the dreaded mystery box third round pick that just always (laughs) seems to slip on a banana and nobody knows what ends up happening with that pick. So if the Chargers were going to come out of round one and round two, with two players, who would you consider those to be, yeah, home run? The Chargers killed this on the first and second round. 21, you know, I feel Darnell Wright. I want to say Darnell Wright at 21 would be a big slam dunk for them to come in at right tackle, have co- have depth, have swing pieces. I'm not saying Trey Pipkins is awful. I'm just saying have depth at the offensive line that you simply have not had over the last couple of years. And if it's not him, I think it's Zay Flowers. I think Zay Flowers at 21 would be a huge win for this offense. I think he's a very talented player, a guy that, yeah, with his size, probably plays in the slot in the NFL, but he's a competitor. He's a guy that's been able to put size on over the offseason. Every single coach, every single scout that has talked to him is like, I need him on my football team, and that's why you've seen him mocked as high as the top 10. I think Zay Flowers or Darnell Wright not only fill positions of need, not only hit on premium value positions, but I think it also moves your strength into a bigger strength, which is the offense into something better. And if the offense is even 1.3 times better than what it was last year. It doesn't matter what happens on the defensive side of the ball. It doesn't matter if Brandon Staley just never figures that part out and it never is this perennial defense it could be if the offense is putting up 30-plus points a game. In the 50s, that is interesting. You're going to have hoping for someone to fall. I think the Kansas State edge, Felix and Nudike Azoma, I think that's someone who, yes, you have Joey Bosa. Yes, you have Khalil Mack, but having rotation there is good. The other guy I'll mention too, DJ Turner. He's the cornerback out of Michigan, a guy that – Played on the outside, maybe is positioned in the slot in the NFL, but a ton of speed, a ton of competitiveness, and a legitimate like day one athlete that probably falls to day two because he hasn't put it all together yet. I I like getting guys on day two that have the athleticism ceiling of day one players. DJ Turner, I have him in like the 30s range. If he gets down to 50, I think that's a sprint to card in situation for um, the Los Angeles Chargers. Whew. Okay, I think we got more guys in this episode than Jake and I have done on all of our prospect <laughs> in the last like three weeks. Um, Austin, man, you're the best. Uh, what is it other than obviously you're like in the weeds with NFL draft stuff every day? It seems like over at the Ringer. Mm-hmm. What are the, some of the latest things you've been working on? Where can folks find you? Like, you know, what's your passions right now when it comes to work? Yeah, it, it's 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 a good question. And Ringer always asks me that too. What are your passions? What are we prioritizing? I'm working a lot with some of the behind the scenes stuff on our succession coverage. We got a lot of podcast content coming out on succession. If you are a big fan of that show, like myself, would encourage you to go to the ringer.com. Also check out the podcast, the watch prestige TV. We're doing a lot of stuff there. And on the NFL side, Working on a handful of things. Most of it is draft, but I'll be with the the Ringer NFL draft crew working with them on that show and then also being with them as we watch the draft on day one. Should be quite the treat. I'm excited for this round one. I think a lot of shakeup is going to happen. Who knows what's going to happen with these quarterbacks? All we know right now, minus 1,100 on FanDuel. That Bryce Young is the number one overall pick. That could change in a week. Who knows where we go up? All right, so then we're going to ask you this. All kinds of smoke, line season, we know it. Uh, what's your prediction? Like bold prediction, something crazy that happens. Always something happens. What's your bold prediction? Doesn't have to be Chargers related. NFL draft first round. Bold predictions. I think Will Levis falls a bit further than than people think. I'm thinking maybe even falls outside the top ten. I think that the he is a more polarizing prospect than he's being billed as, and it's not. It's not the banana eating. It's not the mayo and the coffee. It's not that he got more jacks than people wanted him to be. I honestly (laughs) think that there are concerns with his game that involve his accuracy. And there are concerns that when the offensive coordinator, Liam Cohen, stepped away from Kentucky and obviously went to play with or coach with the Rams. And then you lose all that talent that they had offensively there at Kentucky, that things took a step back. And that's not the type of quarterback that you're taking in top 10. I would not be surprised if you're – 
looking at Will Levis still on the board by the time the Titans are picking, you know, in, in halfway through the first round. And, and instead, the only three quarterbacks that do go in the top 10 are Anthony Richardson, Bryce Young, and C.J. Stroud. Now, I think Will Levis is a phenomenal quarterback prospect. I'm not wishing that on anybody. I'm, I just think that talking with people and hearing perspectives on Will Levis, we went into the combine – Teams are going to love this guy. He's going to be everyone's number one player. He's got this big, strong, smart, you know, everyone's all these buildings. And then we came out of the combine and everyone's like, well, actually, you know, we're not that. So, and then if the NFL doesn't like this guy, I mean, holy shit, this is like fits the tone. It's like a, a clear box of what the NFL normally likes a quarterback. If there's not glowing reviews coming out of the combine, that worries me. I could see a little bit of a slide coming for Levis. All right, mate. Okay, you can find Austin Gale's work at Austin Gale on Twitter. Again, from the Ringer, Spotify, obviously, and also, shout out to San Diego State. I know they were one win away from it all, but SDSU alum, uh, lots of things in play for San Diego, Southern California. Austin, thanks so much for joining us. Best of luck. Get some sleep as you get closer and closer to the draft. You deserve a fresh, cold one once that day <laughs> one is over, because I know you will be having red eyes all the time trying to get this thing done. Appreciate you coming Absolutely. on, man. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, Thank Austin. You.